Well, thanks for the nice welcome. We actually, a few weeks ago, at the Asia Crypt Conference, which happens every year, we asked a cryptographer, hey, what do you think the most important thing that happened in crypto this year was? And he said, well, uh, of course, the answer is obfuscation and distinguishability obfuscation based on multilinear maps. Now, I hate to say this, but, you know, the flagship cryptographic conferences are full of this sort of shit. And if this is the best defense that the world has against the U.S. National Security Agency, we're screwed. So on that note, um, this is a picture that I took at a talk that I went to um, at the University of Pennsylvania last month. Um, this is John Inglis, the deputy director of the NSA. Um, and here he's showing an unclassified NSA slide of how they understand cyberspace. And apparently they understand <laughs> cyberspace as a series of layers. There's people, devices, information, geography, etc. cetera. Uh, I, yeah, so somewhere in there, there's a turtle. All right. <laughs> So, taking our inspiration from the NSA, uh, here's you know, a way that you can understand cryptography. This is just to get our bearings here. Um, so at the top, we have some mathematical problems like factoring a discrete log. Um, from those, you can construct cryptographic primitives like RSA, Diffie, Hellman, so on. Um, you use those in different protocols like TLS, SSH, PGP, the things you use to keep yourself secure on the internet. Um, those are implemented in libraries like OpenSSL and BeSafe. And those libraries are used in these software applications that you as users actually use. We're going to be talking about all of these different levels today. So let's start at the very top with the cryptopocalypse. So actually, like earlier this year, we were thinking, well, last year we actually we talked about factoring, for those of you who are here. And we're thinking, oh, well, the obvious follow-up is this year we're going to talk about discrete log. This will be great. We'll give a nice, you know, instructional lecture about discrete log. Um, so the first, you know, five slides of this will be all that we have the instructional lecture about discrete log because some other things happened this year. Uh, so um, what is the cryptopocalypse? Well, sort of it's, uh, if you look at this headline, this is um, the big picture that you should have. Math advances raise the prospect of an internet security crisis. Oh my god. Um, academic advances suggest that the encryption systems that secure online communications could be undermined in just a few years. Um, this is an article written about a talk at Black Hat um, about the cryptopocalypse. Um, so the cryptopocalypse is uh, sort of summarized in this uh, article, um, a quasi-polynomial algorithm for discrete logarithm in finite fields of small characteristic, which if you are not an academic, perhaps is a little bit more confusing. Um, but essentially, this is a big breakthrough in the discrete log problem for small characteristic fields. Um, the context for why this is important to cryptography is the fact that all of the public key cryptography that we use on the internet relies on three basic assumptions. Those assumptions are factoring integers into primes, discrete log modulo large primes, and discrete log and elliptic curve groups. Um, every single public key crypto algorithm that you actually use uh, relies on one or more of these assumptions. This is all we have after 35 years of public key crypto research. Um, some examples, just to you know, make this really concrete. Um, here I'm generating a, a, an SSH key. Um, it's an RSA key. That means I use factoring, or that I hope that factoring is safe. Um, here I'm looking up Ron Reves' uh, PGP key. It happens to be a DSA key. That means discrete log modulo prime. And here I am. I have a secure HTTPS connection to Google. It's telling me it's using um, ECDHE, that's elliptic curve discrete log, and it uses RSA signatures, that's factoring. This is all we have. Look at any, any crypto system that you use, this is what you'll see. So um, discrete log over small characteristic fields is not one of these assumptions. Nobody actually relies on this in, uh, for public key cryptography. Um, but it is intimately related to the assumptions that we do use, such as factoring and discrete log over um, large characteristic fields. And um, the important thing here is that factoring and discrete log have sub-exponential time algorithms. We've known this since the 80s. Um, there have been no big algorithmic improvements since about 1993. Um, basically, all of the progress in sort of the cryptanalysis of, of these basic assumptions has been improvements due to Moore's law and small implementation details, essentially. And the running time for small characteristic fields and large characteristic fields, basically the same. Until this year, when 
or earlier this year, um, when there was a series of breakthroughs for small characteristic fields. So the only important thing of, that you need to know from this chart is that um, if you look at these numbers, they're getting very large very fast. Ooh, I caught up. Okay, I'm still back. Um, and um, here I've marked there's been some actual algorithmic improvements. There's an L of one-fourth algorithm and an N to the O of log N algorithm for these special fields. Now, what is the impact of this? Um, so if this kind of algorithmic improvement could be translated from small characteristic fields, which we don't care about for cryptography in most cases, to um, factoring or large characteristic fields, then there would be problems for all of the cryptography that we use in the real world. Big, gigantic if here. Everything I'm saying is predicated with an if. So the current um, general purpose factoring running time for some integer um, is this complicated function, um, which is sub-exponential in n. That's all you really need to know. Um, the small characteristic field improvement went from L of 1 third to L of 1 fourth to um, n to the uh, big O of log n. If we took factoring's running time from L of 1 third to L of 1 fourth or something uh, smaller than that, um, then this would be sort of catastrophic for the security of key sizes. So this is just a, a very hand wavy chart. The top line is the current state of the art. Um, if you just sort of blindly take um, sort of uh, this running time to try to estimate the bit security of different sizes of um, RSA keys. Um, so for a 1024 bit RSA key, um, this uh, Equation gives you an 86-bit security, which is approximately right. So we'll just take this as our ground truth. Um, so 2048 bits should have 116-bit security, and 4096 bits should have 156-bit security. If there is a small improvement in the constant of this algorithm, I'm not saying it has happened, but if this should happen, then um, the bit security of 1024-bit RSA would drop to 68 bits, which is already enough to basically be a gigantic problem in the real world right now. Um, 2048 gets pretty close to being scary. If, uh, on, on the other hand, if we dropped from an L of 1 third to an L of 1 fourth algorithm, um, the bit security of RSA, of 1024-bit RSA would, would drop to 49 bits, which is basically solvable um, almost immediately now. Um, and even 4096-bit RSA would be way too close for comfort. This is thought, food for thought, I guess. Um, the upshot of this, however, is that no, we don't know how to adapt the, these big improvements for uh, small characteristic fields into um, the cases that we care about in cryptography now, like large characteristic um, primes or factoring. Um, but this is a reminder that sometimes big progress can be made on old problems. There was very little progress for two decades, and then all of a sudden there was a massive improvement. We do not know the end of the story for factoring, as far as I can tell. There's no proof that these problems are hard in the complexity theoretic sense, and um, therefore, just because nothing has happened for two decades doesn't mean that something cannot happen. Um, Asterisk elliptic curves are a completely different story. All of these techniques are, are unlikely to work in that case. Um, so for practitioners, the things to think about, um, Dan and I actually had some big arguments about what to say here. Um, I want to say don't hard code your algorithms or key sizes because things can change. Um, Dan doesn't like algorithmic, or, uh, algorithmic agility, um, but he says that we, we know what the correct choices are and you should put in the correct choices, which is you know, very conservative choices for elliptic curves. Um, and uh, the big lesson here is listen to the cryptographers because um, this kind of news is actually old news. Um, and if you need to use new uh, public key crypto, think about elliptic curves. There will be a little bit more on this later. All right. We, as Nadia mentioned, have uh, some other topics to talk about because, sadly, some other things happened in crypto this year. Actually, what I found most interesting from the beginning of the year was for the first time in recorded human history, a non-technical user actually tried to use cryptography. Now, as you know, the results were not pretty. They were really not pretty. Um, they, oh, yeah, all well, you went to the keynote, so you know who I'm talking about here. Glenn Greenwald was trying to install PGP. It found it so annoying and complicated that 
Snowden gave up on contacting Greenwald and contacted Laura instead. So, okay, now eventually Glenn got back into the game, but um, this is an example of how unusable today's high security cryptographic solutions are. So maybe let me propose a New Year's resolution for 2014. How about some high security cryptographic software that's so easy to use a journalist can use it? Now, of course, we do have some crypto that's actually deployed on the internet, like TLS, HTTPS. That's something which is a pain to set up on the server side, but it's actually reasonably easy on the user side. But is it actually secure? Well, there have been a bunch of uh, problems with it over the years, and there's some interesting news about that this year. So in February, well, here's a quote from 2008 from the TLS specification, which says there's a small timing channel that's not believed to be large enough to be exploitable. And this is like, you know, in the movie when you see, you know, there's the bomb, oh, but it's inside a box, so it's not going to blow up. You know what's going to happen here. So <laughs> there's this lucky 13 attack announced in February, which says that, yeah, this timing side channel is exploitable. It can be wrangled into revealing plain text data. And look, here's the demo. They actually did it and got cookies out of supposedly secure SSL connections. Now, vendors have experience with this kind of problem. When you look at the details, you see where this timing side channel is coming from is CBC. The way that CBC is used inside TLS, there's some do a message authenticator and then pad and then encrypt because CBC only takes full block sizes for its messages that it's encrypting. And well, the fact that CBC causes problems, we already saw that with, for example, the beast attack and attacks before that and after that. And Lucky 13 is just the latest example of this. So vendors know what to say. When there's attacks against CBC, TLS offers Algorithm agility. TLS gives you the opportunity with less costs maybe than it would have been if it hadn't supported this to begin with. TLS offers the option to switch from CBC to the backup plan. The backup plan is, of course, RC4. So here's from F5. <laughs> F5 is a big network equipment vendor and uh, very widely used, and they are one of many examples of vendors saying, okay, protect yourself against all these attacks like Lucky 13 by configuring your SSL to use RC4. And try to do this on the client side, try to do it on the server side, and RC4 is immune to these attacks. So RC4, by February, was successfully used for more than half of all SSL traffic on the internet, according to some surveys which caused a little bit of a fuss a uh, month later with attacks against RC4 as used in TLS, which would recover cookies after uh, some number of millions or maybe even billions of repetition to the cookie. It's not the fastest attack in the world, but it doesn't need all the fancy timing being close to the server you're attacking or the client you're attacking, like Lucky 13. So RC4 is not looking too good in TLS. There's also problems with using RC4 in WPA. RC4 being broken, this is not news. This is something where RC4 has had weakness after weakness after weakness. Starting in 2000, we're already major papers saying RC4 sucks. This is just not a good stream cipher. And still, it is deployed as, well, it's dropped from 50%, but it is the stream cipher that's widely implemented in TLS. So at this point, TLS has the AES CBC option, which is extremely difficult to implement in a secure way. And it has the RC4 option, which is broken. No matter how you implement it, it just doesn't encrypt your data properly. And then it has, for example, the GCM option if your client and server support TLS 1.2, which your client doesn't, your server might. It's not really a pretty picture. So that's the story for TLS. Continuing with the sort of attack theme that we have going here, um, I want to give a little update on something that we talked about last year in our talk, which was the Taiwan Citizen Digital Certificate. So Taiwan has this uh, sort of nifty um, government level PKI. Citizens can get these little smart cards and use them to interact with their government in a secure way. This is cool. Um, so last year when we were talking about weak RSA keys, um, we reported on a student project from Taiwan um, where they collected three million certificates with um, 
RSA keys in them and computed the pairwise GCDs of all of these keys and found that some uh, actually shared common factors which let them factor these keys easily. Um, there were 103 keys that had this property, so if you have you know, two RSA keys that share one common prime P, you can compute the GCD, that gives you P, you can divide out, get P and Q, that gives you the private key. Okay, so you know, there's lots of RNG failures of this form. Um, you know, you, if you went to Alex's talk earlier today, you heard about uh, weak keys and routers and things. Bad random number generator, end of story, right? Okay, you know, they got to fix it. Then we took a closer look at the prime factors. This is the most commonly shared prime factor in these keys. It's prime. Um, <laughs> it's random. Uh, this is the next prime after 2 to the 511 plus 2 to the 510. So, yes. Um, that's a uh, problem with the random number generator. This is the next most commonly shared prime factor. <laughs> And as we went down the list of the prime factors, we found a whole bunch more of this form. So by sort of extrapolating cleverly, doing some trial division, random guessing, um, and some nifty math tricks involving lattices, uh, we were able to factor 80 more keys. Um, this is a lesson that there's lots of ways that crypto can fail if you have a bad random number generator. There's lots of structure in these problems. Um, it turns out the root of the problem was sort of a combination of two things. There's a faulty hardware RNG in the Renaissance AE45C1 microcontroller, which is the card, um, one of the cards that they were using for this um, PKI deployment. Um, and this was combined with a failure to do any post-processing whatsoever on the card output. Um, so. Yes, we factored some keys. So now then the Snowden leak started and <clears throat> cryptographers started being kind of interested in all the things going on there and so the NSA had to swing into action. And so here is what they threw at us. So uh, certainly on ePrint, a publication from the NSA surfaced about two stream ciphers or two small lightweight ciphers, uh, block ciphers um, designed by the NSA. <clears throat> and sure enough, this worked. So throughout the year, there is uh, four more papers uh, on ePrint. So apparently, the cryptographic community has been successfully distracted from looking at this. Actually, it's worse than this. I took an oath of secrecy as a member of the program committee for the FAST Software Encryption Workshop that I wouldn't reveal to you what I'm about to reveal to you. There were eight submissions of papers to this workshop, which were cryptanalyzing Simon and Speck. Now imagine this for a moment. You have like eight papers that are 15 or 20 or more pages each, and we're scientifically obliged to review these papers and have three people write detailed reports about each of these papers. That's like 24 reports, about eight papers, about these NSA ciphers that how could you possibly be crazy enough to deploy an NSA cipher in the first place? But nevertheless, we have to spend time on this. More productive stuff, so we didn't get distracted, so we sat down, we being uh, Peter Schwab, a student of his, Dan and me, and did a small version of the SALT library. So the SALT library is uh, what Nadia had on her slides already. It's a very small, compact, it just gives you one option, but that's the option we think you want. And now you can have the same thing in a very short version, in just 100 tweets. So if you go to uh, twitter.com slash tweetsalt, you can find the whole library in just 100 tweets. There are also some nicer indented versions. A little bit of advertisement, so for you, those of you who are interested in the salt library and other stuff, there's um, you broke the internet assembly going on in parallel in hall E, and tomorrow afternoon, starting at one o'clock, there is a meeting where we will be reporting in more detail about the salt library. So, um, later on in August, some other things happened in the crypto world, um, including the sudden shutdown of an email provider that nobody had heard of before then. <laughs> um, so, uh, Ladar Levison wrote this um, very um, touching letter of um, apologizing that he had to shut down his email provider for unknown reasons. Um, a couple of months later, we actually found out the reason, um, which is, among other things, this document. Um, this is a grand jury summons um, commanding him to appear in uh, Alexandria and bring to the grand jury the 
public and private encryption keys used by LavaBit.com in any SSL or TLS sessions, including HTTPS sessions with clients using the LavaBit.com website and encrypted SMTP communications or internet communications using other protocols with mail servers. This is amazing. I mean, we, you know, since the NSA revelations, people have been speculating, OK, is there some sort of legal procedure that uh, the government can use to get private keys out of internet providers? Is this possible? Is this legally possible? Are there Fourth Amendment restrictions? And then suddenly, like, we have this thing appearing out of outer space, and we actually see that it's happening. And this is so casual that this, there's no way that this is possibly the first time that this has ever been done. But this is the only case that we've actually seen of an internet provider being compelled to turn over um, the keys for their entire service this way. This is incredible. So I want to explain just a little bit of sort of basic crypto to understand why this is so damaging. Um, so this is uh, a diagram of how the TLS RSA key exchange works. Um, this is the most commonly used uh, key exchange method um, if you do a HTTPS session. Um, so the way that it works, the, the client, so Alice wants to connect to, say, lavabit.com. Um, she says, hello. The server replies with the certificate, which contains a public RSA key. Um, then what Alice does is um, she uses that RSA key to encrypt some symmetric keying information and sends it to the server. And then what the server does is it responds by then initiating an encrypted session using the symmetric keying information that Alice sent over. And then from then on, all their communication is done using um, this keying information. So um, once the government has asked for LavaBit's private key, if they have been collecting um, the information uh, that uh, LavaBit has sent, been sending to everybody over time, um, they can then decrypt the traffic that is sent from now on or from any point in the past where they have the traffic. Because they have the private key for this uh, RSA um, key here, um, they can just decrypt the packet that, that, is, um, that contains the symmetric keying information and then decrypt the entire session. So, this, so demanding a private key of this form uh, endangers not just the one customer that they're going after, but every single customer of the entire service. Um, the other thing that the, having the private key allows is uh, for the server to impersonate, or anyone who has the private key to impersonate the lavabit.com server to anyone on the internet, um, because this key has been verified by a certificate authority. This is presumably what the government actually wanted from the server, but as a side effect, they got uh, bullet point number two, which is much more dangerous. Um, in contrast, um, this is an alternative key exchange. It's the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, um, which offers a property called forward secrecy. Um, so the way the Diffie-Hellman key exchange works is that um, Alice and the server exchange um, these values g to the x and g to the y, and then um, using the um, these values g to the x and g to the y, they can derive um, a shared secret g to the x, y. And that will form their private key. And the security of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange relies on it being impossible for an adversary such as the government who is sitting on the wire between them, given g to the x and g to the y, to uh, derive this value g to the x, y. Um, and so this property is forward secrecy, which is that once um, Alice and the server have forgotten the values x and y, then nobody can reconstruct the private key g to the xy anymore. Um, and if LavaBit had, instead of using the RSA key exchange, used a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, then they would not have been uh, endangering their customers in this way. So a, um, a piece of homework for you, as if you're an end user, um, you can actually check whether the websites you're visiting um, have enabled forward secrecy. If you go, um, this is in Chrome. I don't know how your browser works. It's probably similar. If you click on the little lock and you click on sort of connection, you can find out all the cipher information that your um, HTTPS connections are using. Here it says it's using DHE. RSA is the key exchange mechanism. The DHE is Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. Um, that means that it's uh, using forward secrecy. Or if it says ECDHE, um, that also means it uses forward secrecy. But DH is bad and uh, ECDH is bad. You have to have the E at the end. Yeah, E is important. But the DH is better than RSA. Um, if you are a website operator, um, it would be wonderful if you would enable forward secrecy for your users. Um, there are many guides online. Here is one. Um, and here's an example of a website that does not um, 
use forward secrecy. They're using RSA as the key exchange mechanism and a couple of other broken uh, cryptographic ciphers. Um, and recommendation, if you're building a, a privacy tool, please use end-to-end -end crypto. Um, as a little uh, footnote, um, if you try to visit HTTPS lavabit.com now, um, you get a big warning that the server, certificate, cer server certif security certificate is revoked, which means that if nothing else, at least the PKI that we have is working the way that it should. Somebody else had um, the private keys to lavabit.com, therefore um, the security of this entire system is compromised, and the CAs recognize that. In August, there was the Usenix conference, and it made headlines that one of the talks was not being presented. So this was a talk by Barish Ege, Flavio Garcia, Ruth Adult, and what they showed is an attack on breaking the, uh, well, it's car mobilizers, the company behind it that was suing them was Volkswagen, but it was more for their high-end luxury cars. Now, they got an injunction in the UK, and it was saying that they couldn't publish the paper because that paper would reveal the secret algorithm. It is not they can't publish the paper because they broke the algorithm. It's they couldn't publish the paper because it would reveal the algorithm. Now, we then asked them, hey, could you at least publish the attack? And okay, they were also not allowed to publish the attack because the attack would allow a reader to reconstruct what the secret algorithm is. So. Those who now have these cars uh, are no more secure than they were before, but the people couldn't publish the paper at a cryptocurrency conference. All right, so back at the crypto conference circuit, if you're going to be writing papers about things like indistinguishability obfuscation using multilinear maps, then, well, it doesn't mean that you don't care. And so a bunch of people got up on stage and sang to the, soon, to the tune of uh, Surf in USA, a song called Spy in NSA, which finished off with something like, everybody use crypto, screw the NSA. I'm not going to spend the next three or four minutes trying to sing this for you. Go to youtube.com slash the URL listed there. I think it's a zero and then R-I-C-O-X <laughs> underscore lowercase O-Z-B-4. Um, in more uh, serious news, at Chez 2013, so this is the cryptographic hardware workshop that happens every year. There was this terrifying paper where I'm going to have to give you a little bit of background. You know that current Intel chips, the big Intel chips, maybe not the low-end atoms, but anything like a Haswell is going to have inside it a random number generator, which Intel's been telling you to use to generate your random numbers. You're not supposed to use all of that entropy collection, this kernel entropy pool or RNGD or anything like that. You're not supposed to have something where there's lots of different interrupts and entropy sources and timings of this and that all being hashed in a complicated way. In your application, you're just supposed to take RDRAND, which is this new instruction, or I've learned from the Intel people, I'm supposed to say read RAND, R-D-R-A-N-D. You're supposed to just call that instruction. They don't make it privileged, so you can use it from your applications. It's not just for the operating system. And I did a GitHub search a week or two ago, something like 32,000 results for applications using read RAND, or, well, files, so maybe some of that is documentation. Lots of people are using read RAND. Now, this, in the last few months, has raised some controversy. People saying, hey, is read RAND actually trustworthy? And Intel says, well, yeah, yeah, we designed it like this. We're sure it generates good random numbers, much better than that Taiwan smart card you heard about. We know what we're doing, generating random numbers. But wait a minute. What if Intel's actually generating AES output with a key that they know? How would we be able to tell the difference between that and random numbers? Or what if somebody else knows a key? And well, Intel's response to that was, it's OK. We, we produced these chips, and we looked at them through an electron microscope, and we verified that they don't have anything. You know, Even if somebody managed to sneak into the manufacturing room, we checked through an electron microscope that everything's laid out exactly as it should be. Now, what this paper is saying is here's how you can manufacture a chip so that through an electron microscope, it looks totally legit, and it's backdoored. So this paper, it's, it's worth reading the paper. If you're interested in hardware and what you can really do by maliciously manufacturing hardware, it's a fantastic paper to read. And it's telling you that everything that Intel has done, at least that they've publicly stated, for verifying that their random number generators working properly could actually have been backdoored. And they wouldn't have been able to tell. 
Intel says, well, yeah, um, yeah, um, well, we're looking more closely, really, and uh, everything's fine. So, all good. Here comes a little bit of a blast from the past. For reasons that become clear soon, um, I would like to take a look at the random number generator, which is uh, not quite as interesting as the read rand in that we have hardware graphics. This is a software um, pseudo random number generator, so you have to feed in some seed, some true random number generated by something like the Intel chip or something else. And then um, you can have an optional input, but it's not really recommended. It runs through this algorithm a few times. Now, what it does there is it is doing operations on the elliptic curve. So at every moment, so once you're through the initialization stage, then you always run around to the XOR thing there. Usually you XOR zero, so nothing happens there. You have the scalar T. You compute T times P. P is a point on the elliptic curve. This point is hard coded in the description. Now, then you take the X coordinate of this point. You take the, well, usually it's 256 bits. You discard the top 16 bits and output the rest. No, you take the rest and call it S and then compute S times Q. Now, from this thing, you do the same procedure and then you actually output it. Now, you've taken your randomness and gotten some other randomness from it. So, 256 minus 16, so you have 240 bits of randomness. However, you want to get more randomness out of it. So, you also feed this S into the feedback and now S changes to T because your X always zero and so you compute the next time the x coordinate of the previous point times the point and keep on running. Each time you output the 240 bits. Now, at the time that this was designed, the earliest reference I could find was a public draft which was um, given at a NIST workshop in June 2000. Uh, ju uh, the workshop was July 2004, the, the draft is from 2004 in June. Um, at that point, this has been already discussed in ANSI, but I haven't been able to track down any, any early documents of it. So at that point, NIST was inviting um, people to look at this and say how great it is because, hey, elliptic, I mean, look, I like elliptic curves, but at that point, I already existed as an elliptic curve researcher. and was like, this is not how we design elliptic curve random number generators. We had a bunch of those out there with security proofs and Ideas, in particular the idea that you never ever output more than half of the bit length. So out of the 256 bits, you should never ever output more than 128. And there's just no way that these 240 bits will be anywhere well distributed. But it sounds very nice. They have a number theoretical problem there, and we all know that the discrete log problem on elliptic curves is hard. So if you're giving these points P and Q an elliptic curve, then they, you can have a hardness relation to the hard problem of finding an integer so that this integer times P gives a point Q. Now, soon after, lots of papers came out saying, <laughs> this is really not pretty, this is not how it should look like. So there was Christian Gerstein saying that the output by sequence is biased, which is absolutely not a surprise. As I said, we should never ever output more than half of the bits of such a thing. And if you output too many bits, then you get a bias. He was saying that, okay, he doesn't know how to turn this into a real break. So you have a, have a quote from some official input that he gave to the, the NIST standardization process. But the point is, if you take all this pain and suffering of taking such a slow random number generator because you want something proven secure, then you shouldn't have anything as an outcome that's biased they should not be accepted in a generator based on number theoretic assumptions. About the same time, Dan Brown with Certicom um, was publishing something which is, looks like a security proof. So he was showing like, okay, if you assume that P and Q are random, then this thing is secure. Where he said that the output sequence as points is secure, and then also shows, similar to the Gerstein, and so these papers were later on merged, he shows that there is a bias if you look at this as a bit sequence. He already has a statement in there that this proof makes essential use of Q being random. If anybody knows an integer D, so that D times Q is P, previous slide, we had A times P is Q, you know the group order, so if you know this A from the 
from the description, you also know the D here. They are interchangeable. They're not the same. One is one over the other. Uh, the, two, the product of the two is one modular group order. So if you have one, you get the other. And he concludes that if you would know such a scalar, then you would have a distinguisher. A distinguisher is a kind of thing where you're like, yeah, OK, you don't want to have a distinguisher. You don't want to have a bias. But it's not really a break. Um, two colleagues from my university, Eindhoven, uh, Andres Sidorenko and Beris Rumakis, also 2006 in May sent a um, note to NIST saying um, that the output bias is even worse than what looked like in the, in the previous two papers. And I was talking with them lately because of some news, and uh, Barry told me, yeah, he got this reply from, from NIST saying that, well, they can't really remove this RNG anymore because it's already being used. Now, this is a little strange, because they were asking for comments before making it a standard. In 2006, it was not yet a standard. They were asking, hey, should we have this as a standard? But then, no, sorry, they cannot remove it because it's already implemented. Um, a year later, at the Crypto 2007 RUM session, uh, Daniel Sumov and Nils Ferguson were giving a talk and showing that it's not just a distinguisher, but even a backdoor. So if anybody knows this D, then they can predict the sequence. It's a very small computation, and you can just um, get the next points. Now, the NIST standard differs from the ANSYS standard in that there is an appendix showing, yes, you can choose your own points. You do not have to use this um, P and Q that we publish here. But the, the standard is full of words of saying, well, you should use these as much better. If you don't use them, you have to go through all kinds of hops and prove that these are um, randomly generated. But at least the standard allows it. Now, if you look at what we know now, so September 5, suddenly there was the publication of the Build Run program, which, as one of the topics, has to insert vulnerabilities into commercial encryption systems, IT systems, networks, and endpoint communication devices used by targets. And also to influence policies, standards, and specifications for commercial public key technologies. So apparently, the NSA was um, having its fingers in the game. And soon after that, the New York Times actually names the dual EC event number generator as uh, a candidate for this. But honestly, at that point, I was like, yeah, but nobody will use this. I mean, we all said in 2006 and 2007, don't use this. I mean, after the, the backdoor thing, it was really, really clear that nobody should ever possibly use this. Now, when you look at, um, I put a URL uh, on the slide, there are actually quite a few companies that have FIPS validation for their RNG implementation of this system. Most interesting part is, when you look at this list, there are very few of them which have it enabled as a default. But RSA BSafe library is one of these. Now, on the positive side, NIST at that point had enough public pressure to open the discussion, and they're now recommending against using this particular RNG, and they're asking for comments of people, and uh, I think the comment is pretty clear. No, we do not suggest to continue using this system. And RSA has also stated that, based on NIST recommendation, they now recommend that users change it uh, from the default, and the new library would be changed. Uh -oh. Oh, Who's sorry. I oh, ah, you. Sorry. Actually, we did some fun. We have some implementations. Now, um, I said before that out of the 256 bits of your Xcode, we only give you 240. Um, when you now read the standard where you know that this is likely a backdoor and likely something where the NSA wants you to use it, then um, it's very interesting that it goes that you should not add extra randomness. This is an RNG. You should think that randomness is a good thing here. But it very clearly points out that, no, 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 please make sure to use the affine representation, which is unique for a point. Do not give us anything that we cannot figure out how it works. Um, so here is how the attack works. So assume that you have the secret D, you have the NSA backdoor. Then you can compute, um, you can expand this candidate RI, the 240 bits, to a point. For every candidate, 16 bits, you have a 50% chance it works. If it doesn't work, then move on to the next one. 
So if you're missing 60 minutes, that's 2 to the 16 out of those, 2 to the 15 will work for the next few steps. So then you have to do two scalar multiplications, check with your NSE secret backdoor the next point, compute the x-coordinate, extract the next scalar, and check whether the next output actually matches the output you've seen. If it does, it's very, very, very likely the right point. If it doesn't, OK, move on to the next one. Now, we implemented this. And on a single core, on a kind of recent processor, it takes 20 seconds to go through all 16 bits. If you removed more bits, if you move like eight bits extra, then it takes 85 seconds. It's still pretty doable to check all of them. But if you remove like 32 bits, then it starts being painful. But the NSA has a few more than just one core. <laughs> so if you throw like 64K cores at this, then you're down to the 20 seconds. Now, but you know, in 2004 or 2005, this looks like a big computation. So yes, um, the standard is very clear and says, for performance reasons. <laughs> hey, 20 seconds with 15 day, that's performance reasons. For performance reasons, the value of out length should be set to the maximum value as provided in table four. Do not. Do not think of giving us fewer bits than the 240. OK, so later in September 2013, people are starting to look at more of these NIST standards. It's not just the EC dual, dual EC DRBG. But there is, for instance, the SHA-3 competition. Now, there's a long history of competitions in crypto, and it's one of the best ways that we have, having an open competition. Well, maybe it's not completely open if NIST is then declaring who the winner is, but if you look back at the AES competition and, say, the SHA-3 competition, then there's been pretty widespread support. I mean, the, the algorithms that were selected for AES and for SHA-3, listen to Bruce Schneier, for instance, he had one of the competing candidates for SHA-3, and he said, yeah, the, their choice for SHA-3 was fine. And same thing for AES. Everybody, well, maybe there are a few complaints, but, but everybody feels like these are reasonable algorithms and nobody's been seriously criticizing the, the, uh, the choices. Except after the SHA-3 competition finished, it's been more than a year since the SHA-3 winner, Ketchak, was announced, after the competition finished, NIST has been writing all these detailed standards for, okay, what exactly is SHA-3 compared to this catch act that the competition was about? Now, for comparison, AES was submitted 15 years ago or something, whenever the deadline was, a few years of competition, people trying to, to break it, and then the standard was exactly the same algorithm that was submitted, 128-bit keys and 256 or 192-bit keys. They threw away some options, but they, they kept the core options with zero changes. And now, well, Marsh Ray was tweeting 19th of September this year that NIST is proposing to weaken Ketchak, the winner of the SHA-3 competition, far below what was cryptanalyzed during the competition. Now, the weakening is something like they were taking, for instance, some 256-bit security options and turning them into 128-bit security. Probably not a problem, but the process is kind of scary. We, we like these competitions because everybody can see what's going on, and at the end, there's never been a case of an algorithm being selected that was unpopular and lots of complaints about it. It's always been popular algorithms being selected, so the cryptographic community is happy with AES and with SHA-3 as it finished the competition, and that's not the same as what NIST in August and September was talking about standardizing. So after this, NIST has said, after a whole lot of public outcry, they've said, oh, oops, um, yeah, maybe that wasn't the best idea. Other NIST stuff, so <clears throat> back in May this year, we, Dan and I were giving a talk, which we had titled The Security Dangers of the NIST Curve. So this was a talk about elliptic curve cryptography, and we're going through the current suggestions of the NIST P curves, so the P256, 384, and so on, and showing that it's really, really hard to implement them properly, that if you want to implement the curves in a way that you don't have failures, you don't have sagittal attacks, chances are you're doing it wrong. We also had in there one slide saying, oh, by the way, the um, provenance of these curves is kind of questionable. The NSA generated, and you know, if the NSA would know something which happens like with a chance of, say, one over 10, billion, uh, 10 million, they could have tried hashing lots of different seeds until they find one of the curves that's weaker. 
Now we put those slides online, and sure enough, Matt Green pops up and saying, well, what if the NIST or NSA know a weakness instead of, I mean, we're thinking they have a trapdoor. He says, oh, a weakness. You know, NIST might be nice to us and actually wants to protect us. This was May. Um, in September, um, he tweets saying, discussion with Hashbreaker from when I was younger and more naive, pointing to this discussion. Now, we put this into the September part of the talk because Dan and I were working on a page called Safe Curves, how to choose safe elliptic curves for using cryptography. And we're going on this page through all the known security criteria for elliptic curves, and we have the machine verified. Uh, we also include like usability questions, like how easy is it to implement them in a such on a secure way. We have a map called Alligator, together with Anna Krasnova and Danny Hamburg, um, where you want to map a string to the curve point and back. And we also introduce a new curve, which uh, Silent Circle is most likely going to use for their um, sound mail system, uh, sorry, for the sound phone system. We also have a comment in there about whether these curves could be backdoored. So when you go to safecurves.cr.yp.to, you find on the first page this overview, green is good, red is not good, and there are just not many curves which have a whole row of green. In particular, the NIST curves do not have a whole row of green. Another big development in elliptic curve cryptography this year, I mean, it's not really this year, but it's sort of this year, is Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is everybody's favorite cryptocurrency. Um, and this was not the year that it was invented, but this was sort of the year that it went mainstream, as shown by this uh, plot of the Bitcoin exchange values to real money. Um, I, you know, I've, I'm sure many of you uh, own Bitcoin and everything. Um, I, I, think, I find it very interesting because Bitcoin has suddenly got the entire world, like normal people talking about our coming cypherpunk future, where we have decentralized, um, you know, pro-libertarian, everybody is free to implement all the strong cryptocurrency they want. Um, it's very interesting. This is sort of the Napster moment for cryptocurrency. Um, so on a... Uh, Sort of on a cryptographic note, um, so okay, so ellipt uh, Bitcoin relies on um, elliptic curve, the elliptic curve DSA algorithm for its signatures. Every transaction that you do is signed by your um, address, which is your key. Um, and uh, the DSA algorithm and the elliptic curve DSA algorithm, um, these are NIST standards, and they come with a little uh, sort of um, bomb that is built into um, these standards. It's a little landmine that if you happen to trip across it will cause the algorithm to blow up in your face, which is that if you use bad randomness to generate your signature, suddenly your private key is revealed. Strange property. Um, and it's possible to get around this, but if you don't know how to get around it, then you might have an accident, as um, hundreds of people did with their bitcoins. Um, and so there is some enterprising soul um, with this Bitcoin address who has been watching the blockchain for the past nine months or so and stealing Bitcoins from people who happen to use bad randomness in their Bitcoin transactions. This person now has more than 59 Bitcoins. Um, some of these ended up being due to an Android and Java random number generation vulnerability that was disclosed in August. Um, not all of them are. So. It's interesting what happens when you suddenly have irreversible transactions that are secured only by crypto standards and implementations from random people on the internet. Okay, so muscular one of these entertaining code names for NSA GCHQ programs. Everybody's seen this wonderful picture where in the middle, at the bottom, you can see SSL ad and maybe I can point to it here just in case anybody hasn't seen it. This is some NSA person writing SSL added and removed here and putting a little spy kind of smiley face in the middle. And that's the Google front end. So SSL is only outside of Google at the time this picture was drawn. And then inside, hey, NSA can just uh, as the part on the right says, traffic and clear text here. Google's just sending all their traffic and clear text. They've been changing this after seeing this uh, picture. The official Google statement about this picture said, we are outraged. 
So that's already pretty serious. The unofficial but very public uh, Google statement about this said, fuck these guys. <laughs> the The lesson that we've added at the bottom there is, even if there's problems with SSL, you know, it's a whole lot better than sending around clear text. So deploy something, you know, even if it's better, even if it could be better, it's, it's going to be better than clear text. Meanwhile, at the NSA. <laughs> also, meanwhile, at the NSA, here's another slide from this uh, NSA presentation that I went to. Um, it's a little bit blurry from the picture, but there's kind of like this diagram of cyberspace on a railroad track, and <laughs> one rail is labeled protecting and maintaining privacy and civil liberties. The other rail is labeled safeguarding wealth and treasure. <laughs> this is the strangest mixed metaphor I've ever seen. But I'm pretty sure that it means that all of us on cyberspace are being railroaded by the NSA. <laughs> Oops, I forgot. This was my slide. Uh, yeah, so something else that happened this month. We're almost at the end of the year here. Um, and sorry for anybody who had crypto news that we left out. We have limited time. Still a few minutes left, though. So XCD is one of the most popular ways to encrypt your hard drive if you're doing that, which I do. And I hope, actually, I'm curious. How many people here are encrypting their hard drives? All right. All right. <laughs> All right, one of the original standards for hard drive encryption, encrypting each block, is XCB. And it actually has two versions. The second version, XCB version 2. Well, this paper from Chakraborty and Hernandez Jimenez and Sarkar, 4th of December this year, is saying XCB is not secure as a TES. TES is the sort of thing you say to make sure that people who haven't been in the community aren't allowed to write papers. If you say it's not secure uh, encrypting your hard drive, then everybody laughs the paper out of the system. You have to know to say it's not secure as a TES. Anyway, this is saying it's not secure as a disk encryption system. There's an easy attack, faulty padding scheme, blah, blah, blah. Proof of the security theorem is wrong. And then the, the really funny thing is this, again, this is a second version. The um, first version was thrown away because the authors of XCB said that they were modifying it to help the analysis, to enable easy analysis. Maybe that means to make the cryptanalyst job easier. Somehow they changed XCB in a way that, well, they said would actually allow a security proof, but the security proof was wrong, and they made it weaker. Actually, the original XCB, from everything we've seen now, is stronger than the modified disk encryption method. Now, there's lots of even worse ways to encrypt your disk, but this is kind of scary that we have these provably secure standards where the proof is wrong and it's still standardized and lots of people are using it. I haven't seen any comments from the authors of XCB about this attack. Another attack that happened is acoustic attacks. There's a long history of power analysis attacks this is watching the power consumption of your CPU or whatever your cryptographic device is, smart card or something. And the acoustic attacks are doing power attacks where they're reading out the power signal instead of through a wire, watching voltages or something on the wire. They're watching the hum of a capacitor or something else that's making noise, and that noise gets sent through the air. If you look at this picture, you can see some sort of cool parabolic microphone here focusing on a target ThinkPad over on the right side. And so from a considerable distance, they were able in one hour to find a 4,096-bit GPG key. The one hour was the key was being used for, somehow they were forcing the machine to do a lot of decryptions using that RSA key, and then they got the 4,096 secret bits. Now, you might think, okay, I can look around the room, there's nobody who's that, that close to me with a microphone. <laughs> but they also demonstrated the same attack using the totally wimpy microphone on a typical smartphone. And again, one hour, they managed to get a 4,096-bit key. The they here is Genkin and Shamir and Tromer.
So another thing that happened in December was that President Obama's personally picked NSA review panel released its transparency report um, on the NSA. Um, this is a 300-page document, so it's a little bit difficult to get through in the uh, couple minutes that we have left in the talk. Um, <laughs> But here's one interesting paragraph, uh, which appears near the end in one of the appendix appendices, um, which uh, is talking about specifically cryptographic vulnerabilities. So um, I have, for ease of reading here, um, underlined all of the weasel words that are being used in this paragraph. Upon review, we are unaware of any vulnerability created by the US government in generally available commercial software that puts users at risk of criminal hackers or foreign governments, not our government, the only foreign ones, uh, decrypting their data. It goes on. So, under this program. Un yeah, under this program uh, is the only thing missing here. So, um, just to illustrate this, uh, here's a list of, um, you know, some wild speculation, some of it perfectly reasonable, like the first one, and some of it totally unreasonable, like the last one, that is not ruled out by this paragraph. The NSA could have backdoored the dual ECDRBG and only they have the key. They could have backdoored the NIST curves and only they have the key. They could have introduced vulnerabilities into cryptographic software like OpenSSL, which is free software and not commercially available. They could have... <laughs> Uh, introduced backdoors into Windows, Mac OS, and Red Hat, which are only three commercially available operating systems out of the hundreds that are on the market. <laughs> they could have introduced backdoors into cryptographic hardware, because that's not covered by the commercially available software that they were talking about. Um, things like the Intel hardware RNG, um, or the AES instructions. Or they could have modified 100% of the general av generally available commercial software to disable encryption whenever possible. Um, and, you know, finally, they could have built in a key escrow feature into AES that allows lawful access to any AES encrypted data anywhere. How are we supposed to know with that kind of denial? Now, what we learned soon after was that RSA has accepted a payment of 10 million U US dollars in around 2004. Speculations are it's not just one payment, but multiple payment uh, in order to implement the beautiful EC dual a uh, random number generator that I mentioned before. And so um, it was now disclosed that they actually got money for having this in BSAFE, and this also explains why in 2006 NIST could say, no, sorry, uh, we can't remove it anymore, it's already been implemented. Um, RSA issued a nice statement saying, sorry, we didn't know NIST was the good guys, how could we have guessed that there was anything fishy, you know? Everybody was so excited about Lipticurse at that point. Now, all right, maybe 2004 that was correct, but it certainly wasn't correct anymore in 2006 or 2007, and they kept it in there until September 2013. Now, if you paid attention, I put a little public or commonly stated history of the dual EC earlier. Um, there's one very interesting thing from 2005. Filed January 21st, 2005, a provisional patent later on, it's a patent by Dan Brown and Scott Vanstone from Certicom about elliptic curve random number generation. Now, this is not the patent explaining the dual EC RNG. They actually explicitly refer to ANSI for, explaining, uh, for, for defining this. However, if you look at it, already in the abstract, so, the patent was granted in 2007, even before the Crypt Rum session, and the patent goes in length about how to use the relation between P and Q as an escrow facility. It even goes into details of how this escrow facility could be used in HTTP traffic, that you would guess most of the bits from the nonce, from the server random which is being sent there. So. There's also a part one to this patent, which is saying, oh, if you want to use the appendix of the standard, then you should pay us royalties, because it also goes into details of how to avoid this escrow feature, which makes very clear that nobody would ever implement this. It also gives a very nice whitewash to Certicom, because they say, look, we told the world about it, nobody wanted to listen. We even explained how to, how to use it, and at the same time, it makes very clear that nobody will ever use the protection against the backdoor. So whoever has the key to this backdoor will keep on being able to decrypt all traffic.
Thank you for your attention. Thank you.